that's that will buy. Okay, so we'll get started. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give the introduction to um cell segmentation and then um I'm gonna hand it over to Ashley and then I will take it back again. So today we are in module four. So this part is all about drawing boundaries, which we all love because we all love the segmentation problem. It's a painful problem. So we're going to start off with just a short lecture just to give you uh, some uh, food for thought. <laughs> and then we'll go into the classical segmentation model. And I mean, what do I mean by classical segmentation? So... Traditionally, segmentation is based on your cell boundaries. So most of your deep, in fact, all your deep learning models are practically based on annotating these boundaries of your nucleus or your cells. And then you have these complex architectures that you, that you kind of use to predict those boundaries. And of course, before deep learning models came about, you had your hand-engineered algorithms. So these are mathematical algorithms that you use to predict, for instances, the curvature of your cells and so on and so forth, or the roundness of your nucleus. And then I'm going to introduce um, this, uh, this uh, thing that's kind of new and it, I think it's really very relevant to any of us who are diving into single molecule spatial analysis and that is your segmentation free uh, methodologies. There are a couple of them, not that many, but we will be trying out a base or uh, method today. So what is the segmentation problem? So instead of using words, let's look at an image. So that was, that was a staining that I did when I was a grad student um, at McGill. And that was the image that actually got me interested in imaging and probably brought me into spatial, uh, into the spatial world. So that is the subventricular zone. That's a human subventricular zone. And the space that you see there, that's the ventricle. And then you have your ependymal cells, you have your hypocellular region, and then you have your astrocytic band here, which is in white. That's a GFAB label. And then you have your blood vessels. So your blood vessels are heavily sometimes surrounded by GFAB as well. So the thing is, the segmentation problem, which I hope you see right now, what is the issue, is that you're trying to predict boundaries of cells and you can't even see the boundaries well, right? Because you have different shapes, you have different uh, sizes, you have different uh, extensions of these um, cells. So the shape of these cells, all right, and the thing is, we also sometimes fail to appreciate the fact that when cells collectively come together, they form a separate collective shape themselves. And you cannot really understand or tease them apart. So when you're applying your cell segmentation model, it's not about applying a cell post model or a stardist model or a MERSMA model. It's about trying to find the best pattern description feature method that is going to tease out the shapes that you want. Why is it that this is important in spatial transcriptomics? Well, it really depends, right? It depends on how accurate you want to profile your cell types. So if you have cells that are complex and in the brain, the cell, cells are complex in their shape, you know, like neurons, there's no way we can segment a neuron till now, right? We don't have that power. And it really does come down. <clears throat> and there's like a few more um, patterns and images to show you how diverse and complex this architecture is from your single cells right up to the tissue level and right up to something that is uh, multicellular and perhaps at the organ level as well. So the problem is that human vision is extremely powerful and adept at understanding shapes, all right? We learn as, uh, as children, all right, our brains and our, our, what do you call it, 
our brains and our neurons are actually engineered, not just engineered, they are also trained. So the human brain is probably the first AI. Nothing can beat that, all right? So just know that we are perpetually learning and training ourselves even when we sleep, all right? So we are engineered, we are trained to define and understand shapes as a child, right? And it's not just through visual cues, we have pressure receptors, we have uh, textual differences, we have touch receptors, all right? All these collectively go into our training model, which is the brain, all right? So the next time if you have a dream, just re remember that your brain is probably fine tuning and it's weights between the neurons. So this is important, all right? So we are visually, we are adept at capturing these patterns, but to teach it to a neural network, that's a different thing, right? So on your right, these are simple transformation um, algorithms. So you have translation, you have reflection, rotation, and dilation, all right? So when we construct this, when, we, when our math teacher used to ask us to do this in, uh, in class, right? What is that model called? Coordinate geometry, right? So you'll take your, your ruler and then you will draw, you'll have a scale factor. But the thing is, the human brain does this effortlessly. So I can look at you upside down and I'll know who is who, right? We don't have to even think. I don't even need to like tell my brain, please do a rotation right now. All right? It doesn't matter. It will collectively will do everything. All right? So we are very agnostic to all of these features. All right? So we have all of this and we are trying to copy and mimic these rules. All right? And now we are trying to understand and overlay these rules and principles on an image and we're trying to predict boundaries. And that is where the segmentation problem comes about because we do not have sufficient information about the rules, all right, that define and will make us, that will allow us to identify these boundaries. So, the current solution, so these are the current solutions to solve this problem, all right? So we have three of this, all right? So one of it is your classical segmentation. So classical segmentation, what do I mean by classical segmentation? Classical segmentation, you have, it's, it's all image driven, all right? So the image is a very, the image is a very powerful means of, um, of let's say, um, training data. So your transcripts, your proteins, Everything can be disorganized. It can be biased towards certain subcellular spaces. All right, but when you have a specific marker that is training for your DAPI or for your membrane or your cytoplasm, all right, that truly is universal. So you kind of um, can, can understand the volume, all right, and the area in which your cell is uh, in. And we are trying to define and we are trying to model that. So unless you sit down, and you draw, and if any of you have, I mean, if you're into VR, you can put on a headset and you can then do a 3D modeling, all right? So it's all about drawing the boundaries and then you're trying to predict the boundaries. So hand-engineered algorithms, and there are many, but one of the more common ones that you would have come across, if any of you have used PG, all right, or cell profiler is your Otsu, uh, background, foreground, uh, thresholding method, followed by your watershed method, which then separates them into object. So the basic premises for many of these hand-engineered algorithms, all right, is the fact that, number one, you want to understand the, what is background and what is foreground. So foreground would be your region that is occupied by your cells, right? So you don't want the background. And then after that, you want to understand and you want to objectify these uh, foreground measurements. So you want to get objects. So that is the purpose of your single cell segmentation. You want these single cell objects so they can use them to containerize your protein expression, your gene expression, or any kind of other molecular expression. So that is the basic principle. So what about deep learning methods? Deep learning methods have very fancy architectures. The concept is still the same. You need to define what is the foreground from the background, 
and then you need to ensure that you can identify the objects as accurately as possible. And I, as much as yes, I think that you shouldn't overemphasize uh, too much on a neural network and the simpler the neural network is better. But the thing is neural networks are extremely good for this process because you can have thousands of images, thousands of cells in an image, all right? You will not be able to um, understand all of them. And when we pick and choose, all right, our models, all right, and we want to train and apply to a bigger model, that's where the efficiency of the neural network comes in. Neural networks are also really adept at these, um, what do you call it, optimization methods. So they have different, we have different objective functions and it will reduce the error rate, all right, as much as possible so that we can apply it. But at the end of the day, all right, no matter what your neural network is or how complex or how different, whether it's Salpos or Stardis or MERSMA or any of these models, all right, the fact remains that they are only as good as the cells that they have seen, all right? All machine learning, all AI, we are not at the age of iRobot yet. Not yet. We don't have conscious AI. All right? Um, so the thing is, we have to train it. And the thing is, if you are telling me that you're going to take this deep learning model and you're going to apply it to your image analysis to segment so that you can assign your transcripts more accurately, and you're going to tell me that, oh, I've never seen the image before, that's not a good answer. You have to look at your image, all right? So what are you trying to solve? So what are your goals, all right? And how accurate do you need your segmentation to be? It's always not true that you need um, to have a robust segmentation. So if you're just going to be uh, performing spatial profiling, I think it's really okay if you just want to segment and identify your nuclei and then you want to do a simple um, expansion of from your nuclei to just have, a, what do you call it, a defined cell region. So you're not really interested in capturing the full measurement of it. So this might be helpful, all right, in regions of, let's say, your brain, where there's lots of uh, neuronal processes that's crisscrossing, all right? There's no way you can, you can extend the cell boundary. I don't want to because it's just going to... Um, include a lot of noise, all right? So you want to compromise on that. And the, the thing about um, like platforms like Moscow and Xenium is that the counts are actually quite high for, for single molecular platforms that you have sufficient clouds, not clouds, you have sufficient counts within a certain radii that will give you sufficient uh, gene information for you to define a cell type. So it really depends on your compromise that you want to make. Now, if you find, all right, that you do want to have a segmentation model, then it is best that you review the cells, all right, in that region that you have um, sent for, um, let's say, um, spatial transcriptome. So I always um, have a HNE. &E. I always recommend having a HNE. &E. It's cheap, all right. It's valuable information, all right? We undervalue HME. It's not, it's not that valueless. It's not just uh, purples and reds. You can look at your nuclei. You can have a sense of uh, what your cell densities are like. You can have a sense of if the segmentation model, all right, is going to be robust and which regions, all right, where it's going to fail. It's not, it's not that much of, it's not too much of work, but it's work that I think it's, it's, uh, it's worth uh, doing, all right? Now, so the thing is, yeah, so the third one is really a question, all right? So how many of you here had stained your sample and created it by eye to understand the pattern variation? So I think that is really important to do. Even if, all right, you really do not have a HNE and you cannot perform it, all right? Every single single molecular platform, the output file has got a DAPI image. You can look at it and you will know instantly, all right, where it's overcrowded. If your DAPI is too overcrowded, you will have a segmentation problem. 
in that region. All right. So these are little things that you can take into account. And he's also part of QC. And for, for those who have done extensive IHC, we are, we are all used to reviewing and looking at our, our images directly, all right, to look at these regions to understand. So it's, it's the same rules, right? I don't think uh, just because it's transcriptomics, um, the rules uh, change. So just to introduce you further to the complexity of the, of the segmentation problem. So this is a tissue stain that I did post Xenia. All right. So this is uh, this is one of the samples that I it, that I sent for Xenium analysis last year, and then I stained it with GFAP and Nestin and Dapi. So you can see how complex your your cell structure is, and you won't be able to see this just by transcriptome alone. All right. So you don't have the membrane boundaries. You don't have the other accessory stuff, the biophysical properties of your cells. So the cell, all right, orientation, the cell is not just about cell shape, it's also about the orientation. So if you look at the blood vessel here, all right, so the thing is, if you're telling me that your spatial transcriptomics or your segmentation is able to segment out these fine fibers, all right, you will never be able to do it. And things like neurons and astrocytes on your right, these are astrocytes, all right? These are like star-like projections, and you will never be able to segment them. You can do point statistics on them. You can do pixel-defined uh, uh, intensity analysis on them. But, you know, the best you can do is you can define this whole region in a bounding box, all right? And you can capture some aspects of the transcripts that is surrounding it, all right? So it doesn't mean that if you don't see something in your transcripts, you did something wrong or the platform is failing, all right? It's to do with just the nature of the cells themselves, all right? So just remember that. And if you don't look at your image, you will not see this, right? Yeah. So there is always pros and cons to every experiment. And this is one of the cons, yeah. So. I think that as the platform develops, all right, and we start to include protein labeling, all right, just remember that your image is not just to a proxy or to validate your transcript expression. Protein should not be used to just validate your gene expression. That's all a bit, um, it's kind of downplaying what proteins can do. Proteins can do much more because they can complement your gene expression and any other molecular expression. So then we are going to be looking at segmentation-free methods. So what are segmentation-free methods? So I think this is a very cool idea. And I know Ashley knows this because I kept going on and on about segmentation-free. So the thing is, um, I think it's not just about, so it's the same for protein or any kind of molecules, all right? So for those of you who are doing um, epigenetics, for those of you who are doing lots of protein subcellular analysis or studies, all right, it's the same. So when a molecule localizes, it's not localizing randomly. That localization is not random. So your protein has got a, a purpose to be at the cell membrane, right? So your protein has got a purpose to be at the nuclear membrane. So just like that, your transcripts too have a purpose to be in that region. So it used to be that, you know, we used to think that when we, when we studied our textbooks that your, your mRNA is coded from your, comes from your DNA and then it is transcribed. It is then translated to your protein and then it is probably inside the nucleus or close to it. So it's not like that. So there's a lot of transport that's going on, right? So your cell is a very dynamic, um, it's a very dynamic system. It's like a little factory, right? So all of these molecules, all right, they are forming their own associations in little, little pockets all around your 
um, cells. And we can actually capture this dynamics to actually inform us um, of many things. And one of it is your cell shape. So I won't say this segmentation-free, so I used to say that segmentation-free methods can define cell boundaries, but no, I think it can define cell regions, all right? And as opposed to defining an actual boundary, all right, perhaps what we want is really just to define cell regions, right? So it's two slightly different concepts because you want to, the purpose of, 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 uh, of segmentation in transcriptomics for many of us is just to define what a cell is so that we can make accurate downstream. So if you can, if you can understand these two concepts, then now you can leverage on these statistical models. All right. So these are unsupervised. You don't need training models. All right. But there will be lots of parameter tuning that you will have to do. All right. And the boundaries that it predicts won't be as nice as image-based boundary prediction. It won't because you don't have that contour. You don't have that biophysical property of that cell membrane stain. So you cannot have it can I expect it to be identical? Mm -hmm. So the, the purpose of cell segmentation, um, sorry, segmentation-free methods, I think is to predict what would constitute a cell, all right, and its identity. And you can also go a little further as to even regions, subcellular regions, if you want. But that's a bit heavy, all right, and it's going to, uh, it takes a lot of work, but it's an, it's an idea that I think is very relevant for single molecule spatial transcriptomics. So, so yeah, so there are two methods here, all right, that I added in. So one of it is BASOR. So what BASOR does, so it's just a different way of doing your statistical distribution model. So just to review this quickly. So what BASOR does is that, so each point here is no longer a cell, each point here is a transcript. All right, and then it takes the k-nearest neighbors and you can define this. And it's a bit difficult to define this because many of this, this, uh, this was benchmarked on mostly, uh, I think it's a Moscow and a slide -seek, uh data set. So you have to fine tune this if you're gonna change your platform. So if you're using Xenium, you will have to fine tune. So unsupervised methods, remember that there's no machine learning model for you to learn those methods to converge it to an optimal form. So you have to do it yourself, all right? And BASOR takes a long time. So yeah, just make sure you give it like a whole month. No, just, yeah, not a whole month, but a few days. So then um, you, you look at the number of transcripts and then you bin them into your genes. So this then forms your nearest, your neighborhood component vector. This is not the only method that uses a neighborhood component vector. There's another um, single molecule uh, graph-based um, approach. I think that is a neural network, but that's an unsupervised neural network. It's page to vec. It uses the same thing as well. So the idea is to compute in your neighborhood of that transcript what's the composition of your gene. So it comes from the prediction is that Genes or proteins, I mean, any kind of molecules, they will function together, all right, when they are working collectively for a certain, uh, what, what do you call it, um, for a certain behavior, for a certain output. So in a cell, all right, in a cell, you'll find that if it's an astrocyte, the transcripts that will be enriched in that cell will be very much driven, all right, to comp to have a nearest uh, to have a neighborhood compositional vector that is very astrocytic in nature. So that's the premise. It's a predictive model, right? So it is not defining your shape anymore. It's defining the identity, and then it is defining the region. All right, okay, and then it is giving you a label. All right, that this probably all these transcripts in this region belongs to one cell type. All right, and then you can annotate and label and classify that. So it's a slightly different thing, all right? And it can be a bit uh, intimidating because the cell boundaries look like, they look very jagged, all right? It's not going to be very uh, clear. 
So the cellular pots model, so this is the cell, this is ProSeq. I've not tried it, but I've read it and I want to try it. So the cellular pots model, this, uh, sorry, the ProSeq is based on a cellular pots model. So the cellular pots model is something that is used as a, as a means of understanding cell behavior. So you project your cells onto a lattice, all right? And then it expands and occupies space in that lattice according to its behavior. And it's, so it's a kind of model that um, developmental biologists use. And in this case, they have just um, kind of uh, replaced the objective function. So instead of predicting um, shapes based on behavior, they are predicting, um, what do you call it, um, the boundaries of your cells using the same model, all right? But it is also unsupervised, all right? And um, as you can see, all right, it is trying to understand the composition of your transcripts, and then it builds, all right, the um, region surrounding it. So, so the thing is today, all right, what you uh what you will be going through is um so I won't be I won't really be taking you through like okay let's try salpos let's try mersma um because there's too many of them and I don't have personal favorites and they all have very well engineered tutorials all right but today we're going to just compare the Xenium um, output, the segmentation output, you're going to overlay the segmentation, all right, yourself over the images that I've subsetted. You're going to look at the boundaries. You're going to overlay a subset of the transcripts, and then you are going to compare it with the base or segmentation model, all right? And then we're going to look at the differences. And then in the end, we're going to look at the segmentation um, free method because um, at the end of the day, it's not just about um, doing a segmentation, getting the mask. It's about what are you going to do after that, right? Okay. So now, so the so if you have DAPI alone, all right. So the the work stream. So I'm just going to go through the work stream. Is it's these are these are the three uh, kind of uh, generic work streams, all right. So if you have DAPI, yes, you are limited to an expansion model, all right. So like for me, I was limited to DAPI. I just happened to have H and E staining because I I wanted that in on the slides, right? So if you only that you are limited to an expansion model, you have a H and E slide on the same slide. You can do um, transfer learning, all right? So um, you can go on and you can take a look at Fidias Diamandis uh, Diamandis' lab's um, YouTube channel. So he has different versions of how to use histology. Um, what do you call it, um, maps, and then you can transfer it to other kinds of images, all right? Now, whether it is worth the effort or not, I'm not sure. It, I think it really depends on whether the data set that you have for transfer learning matches the data set that you have. But like I said, you can always just do an expansion model on the Xenium, or you can use Selpos or Mersma, which will then predict a reasonable all right, uh, cell boundary, all right? And all you have to do, like I said, you have to go back and you have to check if it makes sense on your tissue. Yeah, how much of an error is something that you will have to do the work yourself, all right? Because like I, like I state here, point three, you, you know your tissue best, right? So the machine learning is not gonna be better than you for sure, all right? Now, uh, you will compromise and it's really a balance of how much the image is important to you or if it's just a gene signature that you're after. So um, you can go back. The easiest thing you can do is you can go back to your platform that you use to develop uh, to get your uh, spatial transcriptomics data set from. You can go back and you should be able to resegment again using your machines, the machines uh, software, and this is just a practical thing that you can do, right? So Ashley will provide a demo in a while using the Xenium machine, but this should be applicable to other platforms. They should be able to do it, yeah.
Now, if you decide, I want DAPI and I want to apply additional labeling, this is really the best case scenario, right? Like I would do it too, all right? So the thing is, it's not a question about whether you do it before or after the Xenium, you can do both, all right? Both is possible. The slides that I showed before, all right, that was done after a Xenium run and I did the staining myself. But the problem is you do the staining yourself, be ready to image register yourself, all right, you have to do the registration yourself. The thing about doing it together with uh with the um with Xenium's protocol is the fact that it's a single workflow, right? It's the same, right? Whether you're doing a comet uh, uh staining or a aqua biosensors staining, if you do it along, if you do the staining and you run it and you do the segmentation based on their own software, it's going to be seamless. All right, so it's advantages to do that. But the thing is, all right, as we as I mentioned, you need to check your staining and staining patterns. And I know they always, all platforms and all, all industries, they show the best images of their segmentation. It is not true. It does not work like that for every single tissue, every single time. You have to do it. You have to take the images and you have to investigate it. All right. You have to do it. The, the core is doing all it, the core facility is doing all it can to give you the best possible results. But they are not responsible for things like optimizing your staining for you. That is something that you will have to analyze it yourself. All right. And um, if it is, if you're not satisfied, all right, with the staining that they do, you can do the same staining, all right? Now, the cell segmentation kit that many of these that you get from Xenium or many of these, um, what do you call it, industries, it is not something that hasn't been done before. How many of you have done flow cytometry? Okay, so you remember how if some of you might have used dump channel, so sometimes you just collectively just all the channels that you want to exclude, all those markers, you put it in the fluorescent channel, right? So you dump it in, right? So you can exclude it. doesn't matter that you cannot identify, let's say, CD45 and CD34 together. You collectively dump. It's the same thing that many of us would have done when we did IHC because we're limited by a four-channel microscope. So if, let's say I want to, I'm a cancer biologist, I only want to look at the tumors, so I stain it for GFAP, MAP2, or something interesting, but I need to ensure that I mark out my C, my immune cells and my CD4, CD4, uh, what do you call it? Immune cells and my CD34 endothelial cells, or maybe I want to exclude um, even a subclass of astrocytes, I dump it all into a single channel, right? But the thing is, some of you would have noticed that, especially in your immunofluorescence, when you dump all these channels together, collectively, they can become a mask, right? Because collectively, these are all membrane markers. So collectively, what one marker misses out, the other will pick up. So you collectively, you can see the cell boundaries being well defined. It's the same thing that they have done here. So if you go back and you look at their cell segmentation kit, all right, they have a membrane. And they don't just have one membrane marker, they have a few membrane markers, right? And then they have a cytoplasmic marker, all right? The nucleus is the best marker because it stains everything, but even nuclei has its own problem, all right, because DAPI sometimes cannot stain for astrocytes very well. So for, for some of us who have done like, uh, so for me, and I used to do, I do GBM work a lot, sometimes the astrocytes have very weak DAPI signal, all right? It's just the nature of the, of the cell type itself, all right, that gives us this, and sometimes I've seen regions where I cannot clearly see a DAPI. And this is something that even pathologists have seen. There are some segments of your astrocytes, the DAPI is not clear. All right. So you will do all this compensation. So that's what a cell staining kit is all about. And there's nothing stopping you from developing your own cell staining model. All right. So you can do it, but it's additional work. And you'll just have to optimize it yourself. All right, to fit in. And um, so, yeah, so you have you need to check your staining and staining patterns. All right, so 
we are dealing with many of us or uh, most of us are dealing with a heterogeneous community of cells all right so there will be cells that will fail staining all right or segmentation or even both all right and you need um, to really um, do your staining um, optimization now um and then of course we will go through um the um, transcripts themselves all right so just a note on point two is, as I said, you're predicting um, what is what is and what is not a cellular region instead of versus the actual learning of a cell boundary. All right. I still like the idea of the actual learning of a cell boundary. I like that idea a lot, but, but that's because I'm biased because I do a lot of morphometric and pattern description studies. All right, so nothing can be better than an image based. I think the transcript is still going to fail unless we can combine transcript with proteins and other molecules, then maybe our cell boundary prediction will become much better because proteins will define the boundaries well. Um, so yes, so proteins are deposited in spatial patterns that is related to their function. So it really is we are leveraging on the structure form principle. So RNA is to form patterns of localized deposits. And uh, yeah, so like I said, you might want to just ask yourself, do I need a cell segmentation for my model, for my work based on, let's say, um, images? Um, so yeah, so now... Um, I would um, hand it over to, to Ashley, but before that, um, so Ashley, what she'll do is she will give you how you can just go in and do a simple parameter tuning, like a direct parameter tuning. I don't know how simple it is, but a direct parameter tuning, which I think is very, very practical. All right. Uh, but before that, I'll take any questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, can you? you have to press, right? Thank you so much. So for the segmentation, I just, I think I didn't get if you can actually, like you can do these methods that you show, but with the immuno, immuno staining, for example, I, I stain bone marrow. And it happened the same with the stroma cells. That is very like it's 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 impossible to segment if you don't have a marker. So I use a marker, right? NGFR to to see the segmentation. So can I do like the senium, then my NGFR, do the segmentation with another software? You can. You and then can. have that one, and then I can limit my immuno with that. You can. So um this part, right? When you apply your own additional labeling before and after a Xenium run. So if you're doing it during a Xenium run, it's easy because it will segment for you. If you do it after a Xenium run, you stay in yourself, then you have to run like cell post or MERSMO yourself. And then into, and then um, what do you call it? Uh, register it together. But yes, it's possible. We can definitely do it. Right after, I need to scan my slide yeah. like aside. Like I cannot scan it in the Xenium machine. Right no, now, I have to scan it on the... Um, there's a couple questions in the Slack channel. Um, so the first one was, could you tell us which uh, membrane proteins are stained in the Xenium workflow? Um, okay, let me try to remember. So there's CD45. I think there's e -caterin. And then there's Vimentin as well. Yeah. And then there's a couple more and I... I, yeah, I can't remember, but definitely there is uh, Vimentin, E. Cadrin. Does anyone remember? Yeah, I, I can I can post it. I have it in my notebook. I just don't remember it. And then CD45, yeah. Looks like Sarah's on it. Okay, okay, good. Um, Lars says, I'm working on liver tissue, and I'm interested in both liver cells and infiltrated immune cells. I have post-stainings of membrane and nucleus. I have not been able to get a model to detect both liver cell, which are huge and sometimes multinucleated, and immune cells. But I have two models, one for each type. My question is, how can I combine two models of cell prediction? Mm, okay, let me get the...
Well, the thing is, I I think I've done I've done something like this just once before. Um, so what you can do is you can run. So the thing is, you can you can separate them. So you can separate the cell types. So I did that for one of the projects. So you can separate your liver and you can separate your immune. And then you segment your liver and you separate and you segment your immune. And then you just need to combine the segmentation profile for both into a data frame. Okay, great. Um, from Jonathan, cell segmentation precedes normalization and clustering, which were the topics from yesterday, right? Oh, so cell segmentation is independent of normalization and clustering. So cell segmentation is based on your cell segmentation is just separate. So it's based on pixel information. And even if you use uh, the transcript model, the transcript model to predict your cell space, you don't need to normalize your own transcript because what is important is the X, Y coordinates. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think there's one more. Hmm. Yes, I was having the impression, so the impression. Ah, so membrane staining will give a region, but you can still calculate your centroid from the defined area. And the thing is, because in most cases, we will um, choose cells that have an epi, so we can define the cell, cell centroid uh, by the nuclei, and then the surrounding region will just be your, your cell, your cell space or your cell area. Yeah. Or you can simply just uh, ignore the, the nuclei derived centroids and you can calculate it from your cell area. It depends on which one, but in my experience, I've done both. They will both generally just give slight shifts in your, what do you call it, your center of uh, pixel gravity, but it will still be more or less in the center of your cell. Cell segmentation is pretty new for me, so I just wanted to understand like what is the checklist for you to decide whether I want to proceed for the cell seg like the segmentation scale method or segment analysis? Like what is the checklist? Like what I need to see before I decide, like, okay, it is safe to do the segmentation scale analysis. Hmm. Oh no, can I say I don't know? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, um, so how do I define it? Okay, so so in my, in my I think I was, uh, for me, uh, what drove uh, this whole um, segmentation-free method um, was really because I, I, maybe I stared too much at my images and I wanted to understand the um, subcellular localization patterns of my proteins and my transcripts, right? Um, so I... I have a bias towards that because I my whole project is based on finding patterns. So finding patterns means that more than just um, just identifying a cell type, I want to understand what is the structure. But if you're not interested in that structure and you just want to find the organization of your cells, then you don't really need... Uh, it's not that you don't really need I shouldn't say that. So there are two ways you can look at segmentation free. So if let's say you are worried about segmentation problem, and the thing is, I find that when I try to segment my cells uh, very accurately, all right, I always keep failing. And I realize that I don't really care about the boundaries so much anymore. All right, I know that I cannot get a precise shape of the cells. So then you have to weigh in using your segmentation-free method. And if your segmentation-free method is able to identify the hotspots of your cellular signatures, then I think that's okay. Because I just want to find relationships between them. I'm not really necessarily interested in being like, oh, that must be a cell. 
you know, I just want to understand relationships between them. And I'm not doing cell-cell communication. Um, but the thing about cell-cell communication is that because these transcripts seem to be localized in the region in which they are going to function and the protein level, it seems to make sense that if you are doing cell-cell communication, you would also use segmentation free so you can see where and how the transcripts are deposited. I'm not sure whether it will be true for every single uh, case, but yeah, I think it's worth a shot. Yeah. Why, why not use nuclear markers and make means? Uh, yeah, so like I so like I said, you can so the thing is you don't need to use your cell uh, area to to define your cell centroids. You can simply just use the nuclear centroids, all right, that's that's provided by your DAPI staining. That's not gonna change, all right? It's just that your cell area is gonna change. So ultimately, the thing that will change the most when you do a segmentation, when you apply a new segmentation, is the fact that your transcript assignment is going to change. Right? So if my cell boundary for cell A is now slightly bigger, then it's going to pull in more transcripts towards it. Right? For instance, if I changed it from xenium to, let's say, cell post, cell, cell post, is known to give slightly more conserved um, cell areas. So now my transcript assignment. But answering your question on, on, the, on the chat, why not use nuclear markers and make means of the XY coordinates? Yeah, you can use your nuclear markers and you can simply use any kind of nuclear profile to simply just set your cell centroid. Your nucleus will always be there, right? It's not going to change. It's something that's very... Uh, good about the nucleus is that you can stain it and no matter how your cell area is going to vary, your nucleus is going to be static, it's going to be there. Any other questions? Yeah. So with respect to assigning transcripts, um, are there specific tools that you use to do that? I don't know if this is going to be talked about later. Um, so for transcript assignment, yeah, so for me, I have used pretty much, pretty, pretty much for me, whatever that I use for, for my cell segmentation, it automatically came with a transcript assignment. So BASOL will automatically assign the transcripts for you. And for, let's say, um, and then I know that I think in, if you use packages like SOPA, they integrate cell posts with it in their pipeline. And if I'm not wrong, they will do the pipeline does the transcript assignment for you. But if you're going to do your own segmentation mass, all right, that is pretty much not being used in a workflow for a spatial transcriptomics pipeline, then you pretty much have to do your own assignment. And that assignment means that you will have to take the geometry of your plots, the polygons, and then you have to do your own assignment of your transcripts based on nearest neighbor or some sort of gradient um, estimation. Yeah. So we're at a little bit over time for this segment, so I'm going to suggest we move on. But if you have questions, please put them in the Slack, whether you're online or in person. We have seven TAs who will be more than happy to help you out. So next, I will give it to Ashley. Thank you. Hey, okay, so you have me again. Um, and I'm going to talk about cell segmentation and how we've used it in our lab um, in a very basic way by using the Xenium onboard analysis and just you doing some adaptations to the boundary expansion based on the nuclei segmentation. So the Xenium onboard analysis, um, the most basic form that you can use is just using the DAPI stain to segment, first of all, the nuclei. And so what I'm showing you here 
is an image from the Xenium Explorer software where you can see the DAPI stain. And then you can also see in green here the uh, outlines where Xenium has identified a nuclei. And so you can see that in this region in particular in the brain, it does a really good job of actually identifying the nuclei. So this is in the corpus callosum, a really highly myelinated structure in the brain. And even where the cells are quite close together, we're seeing a, a good identification. Where things get more tightly packed, we do see some problems with kind of doublets or just basically not actually identifying uh, individual nuclei. But we're doing okay in general, and I think in general it does a really good job. And then for the onboard cell segmentation, Xenium does a cell boundary expansion. So this will vary depending on what software your Xenium machine is actually using. Um, so if you're using the slightly older software um, and it hasn't been upgraded, then it will automatically set a 15 micron expansion or that will expand until the nearest neighboring boundary. And that's what you're seeing in this image here. The newer software, which I think a lot of machines probably are updated to now, will actually reduce that expansion. So it will be uh, five microns as the default and then or until the nearest neighboring boundary. So if, it's, if there's two cells really close together, it's obviously not going to overlap. And so you can see the boundaries of the cells here. And they're actually color coded according to the onboard clustering that Xenium gives you. So you can get an idea of the sort of clusters you have there. Um, but obviously these are very wide boundaries. And now if I overlay the transcripts, uh, this is also done through the Explorer software uh, on top of that segmentation mask there. You can see we really have a lot of transcripts. And as we would expect, a lot of these are sort of enriched and localized around the nuclei or our perinuclear. Um, but we do also have a lot of transcripts out at the periphery. So these are probably um, in cell processes in the brain. It could be in things like axons, dendrites, and we might have a little bit of sort of diffusion of those transcripts as well. Um, so we can see that it's quite, we have quite a lot that isn't just in the nuclei. So you might be wondering, obviously using something that's on board for segmentation is really nice and easy and it kind of streamlines your workflow, um, but you wonder if it's gonna work for you. And unfortunately, there's really no easy answer to this. So it does depend. And it depends on all of the sorts of things that Shamini has already touched on. So it depends on your cell types and sizes, how densely packed the tissues are, the shape of the cells, the geometries, all sorts of things are going to impact how this cell segmentation will work for you. And honestly, I think in my experience and in the experience of others, you really don't know how well something's going to work on your tissue until you actually try it. So it can be a bit of trial and error with using different methods and then seeing what looks best for your data. Um, so the thing I wanted to talk about today is what I think is quite a common problem. It's definitely something that we've experienced in our lab across lots of different tissue types. So we've experienced it in the stem cell niche in the adult and through development. We've experienced it at the meninges of the, of the brain, so the cells that and wrap the brain, and also we've seen it in the digit tip. And so I'm going to use an example from my own data. Um, so this is looking at oligodendrocyte precursor cells, or OPCs, that exist in the neural stem cell niche. And we're going to ask the question of whether these cells are actually spatially distinct, as in they're transcriptionally different in different regions, or whether this is actually an artifact of cell segmentation. So what I'm showing you here are the two lateral ventricles of the brain. So that's where the stem cell niche exists in the ventricular subventricular zone. And I've pulled out all of the oligodendrocytes, uh, precursor cells that exist in this region. And what we found after we did our clustering and initial annotation of our data sets was that we seemed to have these two quite distinct clusters of OPCs. Um, and this was really interesting to us because we had this cluster 29, which are located very dorsally and are enriched there. And then we had a cluster 36, which are in yellow, which were located around the lateral and medial walls of the stem cell niche. And it was really interesting to us because in our work and also in the work of others in the field, there have been noted some kind of heterogeneity of oligodendrocyte precursor cells 
which appears to be region dependent. Um, they may have different functions and that might translate to kind of different transcriptional profiles. And so we wondered actually if this was something that we were capturing here. A recent paper from the lab had shown that the OPCs that exist in the grey matter versus the white matter are different. So we wondered, OK, well, have we actually seen something uh, real here? Do we really have sort of different OPCs in different regions of the stem cell niche? And so we wanted to investigate that further. And so in order to do that, we did some differential gene expression. And so I'm showing you here at the top just some of our marker genes for OPCs. So they should all kind of well express these, and they do. Um, but now I want to rem remind you of the data that I showed yesterday regarding what happens in the stem cell niche uh, during demyelination and demyelination. And that was this enrichment of um, remyelination enriched microglia at the dorsal portion um, of the stem cell niche. So we had all of these microglia that had a very distinct transcriptional signature or phenotype um, up in this dorsal region. And as you can see, this is really close to where all of these cluster 29, the blue OPCs are. Now, if we look at actually some of the uh, significantly differentially expressed genes, what we actually seen was many of these were actually part of that microglial signature. So we had TREM2, CYBB, LGALs, all of these were some of the core signature markers of these microglia. And we really don't expect to see OPCs expressing genes like this. We haven't seen that in our single cell RNA-seq data. It hasn't really been widely reported in the literature. And as you can see, I just wanted to show you one of these genes. It is, again, I showed this yesterday, enriched in this dorsal region. And so that was kind of curious to us. And we also had done the vice versa. So comparing cluster 36 to 29 OPCs. And if I remind you of the stem cell neighborhoods in terms of the cell types that are there, we know that in the uh, lateral portion around the, the niche in the lateral wall, we have a lot of striatal neurons. So the striatum is right next to the lateral ventricles here. So we have a lot of neurons there. And we also have these neuroblasts, which are the cells coded in orange, which are generated from our neural stem cells and their progeny they eventually make GABAergic interneurons, and then they'll, they'll kind of migrate away. But uh, if we look at the differentially expressed genes here, many of these are actually markers of either neurons from the striatum or neuroblasts. And in fact, I'm only highlighting a few. There are more uh, genes here that we know are usually enriched in neurons. And again, we wouldn't really expect to see our OPCs expressing high levels of neurogenic genes. Um, we don't see that in our single cell RNA-seq data. And so the question really is whether there is actually a real difference between these clusters, whether there was actually a spatial distinction that was transcriptionally real, or if this was an artifact of the nuclei expansion-based segmentation with the transcripts from closely neighboring cells kind of contaminating or bleeding through and getting caught up in the boundary of these OPCs. So if you have processes from other cells coming in, or if you have cells that are very close together and there's just some kind of bleed through. And like I say, we've experienced it in multiple tissue types. Um, and really it would be interesting to know if clusters of cells are spatially distinct because we can find this uh, and when it, in other tissues where it is biologically real, we do have regional heterogeneity, but it's really difficult to actually see if this is, is a real effect when we have this contamination or you know, bleed through artifact, as we're calling it. So there are probably a number of things that you can do to address this, but we like to try and keep things nice and simple if we can. Um, simplest is always kind of the best. We know what's going on. We know what we're doing. Um, and so the first way we wanted to see if we could improve this and clean things up was to um, do reduce the nuclei expansion size. And we also were always referring back to our single cell RNA-seq data in terms of the genes that we expect to be expressed. And so um, in this particular example for my data, I had this uh, wide boundary expansion of 50 microns and we reduced that to five. And um, so you can see that's quite a large reduction and we're cutting out a lot of the transcripts that would have otherwise been included in the cell. Um, we've also went from five to two as well for other tissue types. Um, so 
We are still getting all of the nuclear and the perinuclear transcripts, but we're cutting out a lot. Um, but we've still had a, a reasonable level of expression when we've done this. So I want to move on and show a little bit of an example of how this can improve uh, your identification of cells if you're having difficulty in pulling cells apart as specific cell types because of this kind of an artifact and how that can improve annotation. And I just want to thank one of our TAs today, Sarah Ebert, who's in our lab. Um, she shared her data with me very kindly, let me present it today. Um, so very thankful for that. Um, so Sarah works on a really difficult, just a very difficult tissue. The meninges are this uh, small layer of cells that enwrap the brain and they're very, very tightly packed together. And so in terms of cell segmentation, they are a challenge in general. Um, and she had encountered this kind of similar problem where she knew, she knows from her single cell data and from the literature exactly what kind of cells should be there. Um, she has that really locked down now and she's done a lot of uh, work on that. Um, but when it came to her xenium, um, she was having a real problem and actually identifying the cell types that she knows should be there. Um, and so the first example of this are these border astrocytes. So the border astrocytes are actually very distinct transcriptionally. They're quite different and morphologically, she's found they look quite different as well. They sit at the top of layer one of the cortex and they basically touch the meninges or the meningeal cells. And so with the 15 micron boundary expansion, she was never able to actually cluster these out um, at all. And, th and that was obviously very difficult for her and she needs to see them to be able to analyze them. So she reduced the boundary expansion and as you can see, this MyOC is a marker of the um, border astrocytes, by the way. Uh, she was able to get a distinct cluster after reducing that boundary size. Again, I just wanted to show this example of her arachnoid cells with the DP4 expression. She couldn't actually find a cluster of these, even though they're well defined in the literature. She's seen them in her immunos, stuff like that. Uh, with the 15 micron expansion, but when she reduces this, she does see separate clustering. And then also um, her border macrophages, which are a type of immune cell that are distinct from microglia and exist at the border uh, where the meninges are, are marked by MRC1 expression. She did find a cluster of these with the, uh, the 15 micron expansion, but it was pretty diffuse and disparate. Whereas you can see that when she uh, reduced that boundary size, it was a much tighter cluster uh, with kind of less background. It just looked a lot cleaner. And um, so you can, I hope, appreciate how reducing that cell boundary size actually did uh, improve the cleanliness of her data. It allowed her to annotate a lot better. Um, and so it was a real improvement in terms of what she needed to do with the data. Um, so in order to actually resegment our data, it is very simple, it is very easy, and there's lots of documentation about it, which helps us. Um, so we use Xenium Ranger. We've used version 1.7 and 2, and that depends on what software you've actually run your initial sample on. So you would use the earlier software if you've run on the, or the earlier Ranger if you've run on the older software, and the newer version of the Ranger if you've run on the new software. And we run it on our Linux computers using the Ubuntu interface. And so these are links, by the way, so you can click on them in the slides and it'll take you to some documentation about Ranger and also the command resegment, which is what we use. And I've just shown you our basic workflow. It's very simple and it's actually very quick to perform this. So for one sample, it'll take maybe 10 to 15 minutes to run as long as you aren't resegmenting the nuclei. So it's not a big time investment either if it's just something that you want to try out. Um, so first of all, what our script is doing here yeah. is just calling Xenium Ranger in. Then we're specifying the output file that we want and what we want it to be called. We have to call in our Xenium, bun our Xenium bundle, which is just the path to where your current Xenium data is saved. So whatever uh, the output was that you got from the Xenium instrument, that's where you'll call to. And then we can set our expansion distance. So here you can see I've chosen five microns, but you can really set that to anything you want. You could do two, three, seven, whatever you want. Um, I would kind of advise trying to keep it semi-informed by what you expect uh, in terms of if you've got any ideas of how big the cells should be in that region from your previous experiments or from the literature. Um, 
kind of informing it by that. But of course, it's always just an educated guess on what would be best. Um, and then we've set our resegment nuclei to false because our nuclei segmentation worked well. But you can always set that to true if, uh, if it didn't work well for you and see if you can improve things. Um, so just to summarize and sort of highlight some considerations that you need to make if you did want to try this. So reducing the boundary expansion, I think, can clean up your data considerably um, by removing or at least limiting this contaminating kind of bleed through of transcript strips from closely neighboring cells or from crisscrossing processes, things like that, especially in tightly packed tissues. Um, it's so simple and so easy to implement. So if you don't have a great deal of computational expertise at the moment and you want to sort of try out different uh, manipulations with cell segmentation, this is an easy one to try um, and do. Um, for us, it's allowed us to identify cells which we absolutely know should be there from things like our single cell RNA-seq, from amino staining, from the literature, and we know they're present, but we couldn't see distinct clusters when the boundaries were too broad, but we could actually see them once we reduced that. It's also allowed us to reduce that bleed through to kind of better interrogate our gene expression and potentially spatially distinct clusters. And again, I think this is something that's absolutely strengthened by single cell RNA-seq data, which I keep on talking about, but I really do believe in. If we do end up finding uh, distinct clusters transcriptionally that seems to have a sort of spatial enrichment and we then see uh, certain genes that appear to be enriched in them, we can go back to our single cell RNA-seq, we can look, we can see if we can find that population and then we can interrogate that a little bit further and that might be able to inform our next experiments, be that Xenium or, or any other kind of experiment. Um, the one thing that I think you really need to consider, and you've probably already thought of this if it applies to you, is whether that would actually work for your needs. So in our lab, we're not too concerned about the transcripts which are situated distal to the nuclei. We're not really working with cell processes, axons, dendrites, synapses. Um, it's not something that massively concerns us in terms of the loss of that data. Um, so, so reducing that boundary is okay for us. But if that's obviously something that your work is focused on, then this wouldn't be the right method for you. Um, and you obviously need to try out different things. Um, and Shamini is also an expert in that. So she can, I'm sure, tell you more about what might work better. Um, and yeah, with that, I think I just want to wrap up and just make sure that you know about these different links. Um, Xenium Ranger documentation is really good. 10X always has really good documentation. Um, I just have linked to the Explorer. It's something that um, we use to do our kind of initial visualization and analysis. I didn't talk too much about Explorer today in this uh, module, but if you did have any questions about that or how it works, I'm more than happy to chat about it. And also this documentation about Xenium onboard segmentation can certainly explain the algorithm probably a lot better than I can. Um, and then finally, just to highlight again, I've left my contact information here. If you think of any questions after this workshop, do feel free to contact me. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions just now as well. So all of you had your coffee. And now we're going to do some uh, practical. So, so the next section, um, so when I was preparing for module four, I had to really downsize the sample and do quite a bit of pre-processing. If not, we will never be able to do anything. Every single instance is going to crash. So, but the thing is, I thought, I think since, uh, since this, uh, this class and the participants are so uh, awesome. So we will go through the supplementary scripts and I think I should have done that um, earlier. So I'll go through the supplementary steps today, all right? So that you know exactly how you would want to handle your scripts as well. Because the thing about um, spatial and even single cell is that the data sites, the data sets are really big, all right? And you will run into issues and it is very, very frustrating and you cannot even get started. So you all want to 
uh, play with the toy data set, right? Yeah. So today, what I have used as data set is a human model. So 10X has got a human brain cancer data. And they have this, uh, they have used this human immuno-oncology uh, panel. Um, and it's a brain tumor data set. There's no control the disease. And the reason for choosing this is because they have applied their cell segmentation staining over it. So you can actually have a look at the images uh, themselves. So what I've done is, so you have your images, all right? You have your gene expression data, and then we have our boundaries file. So I had to choose like a portion of it. I downsampled it. So I normalized it based on what we learned yesterday. And then I did um, just basic, uh, I didn't really do much clustering because you're going to be, you're not going to be needing that. So you just need to normalize your data so that you can look at your uh, gene expression later on. You don't even need that actually, all right? So I've downsampled the uh, images. I have also downsampled the boundaries files. So the boundaries files, all right, for both your nucleus and your cytoplasm, they contain polygon information. So they are geometries, all right? So you have groups of cells, all right? And you have vertices, X, Y vertices, which give you the coordinates that will draw your boundaries. And we're gonna draw it, we're gonna plot it, all right? And then to compare, now I could have included something that would just maybe try an alternate image-based segmentation model like cell post or MERSMA. But the thing is, that's just replacing the Xenium derived, uh, image derived uh, segmentation polygons with another image-based segmentation polygon. But what I really want you to compare is, I want you to look at the images, I want you to look at the boundaries, all right? And I want you to get used to how is it that the segmentation model is affecting your polygons and vice versa. And then we're gonna draw the boundaries, all right, from your base or model. And then you're gonna to get to see it. And then we're gonna compute some simple statistics, all right? And then we're gonna probably discuss and get some sort of an intuitive sense, all right, of how difficult it is to define a good segmentation, all right, based on your visual cues, based on statistical um, estimates, proportional estimates in this case. And then we're gonna do a very short and small segmentation-free method. So I have chosen three genes, just as a toy data set, it's uh, CD45, PTPRC, CD45, and um, what's the other? Oh, um, ANGSA1 and STML1. So ideally, these two, these three markers or biomarkers, they belong to separate cell types. Even in GBM, they should be more or less, they should not overlap. All right. And I want you to get a sense of how the transcripts are distributed in space. All right. And how at the borders, all right, is where the probability or the statistical significance drops, all right, in confidence. You want to predict, all right, the assignment of your transcripts. Okay. So I just want to run this through, all right. So I know that sometimes it is difficult to start or begin your experiment. And the thing is, the general, the general profile or the general pipeline, pipeline is not going to be any different from the standard pipeline. So the thing is, remember that you are, you are actually now in a modular pattern of experimental design, right? So you have your favorite platform for your transcript expression or your favorite, favorite platform for your protein expression. And then the next step is what? So you have your choice of tissue, that's the first. And then you have your favorite, um, what do you call it, uh, profiling platform, whether it's protein or a gene. And then you have your choice of uh, segmenting your tissues or identifying domains. And there is nothing stopping you from just avoiding cell segmentation and just identifying domains. Maybe you're just interested in regional, region-based 
um, analysis. So you can simply take your mouse model, you can draw, this is my first cortical layer, my second cortical layer, and I just want to look at my cell profile or my transcript expression. There's nothing stopping you from doing that, right? Because you are defining your questions for your project. But if you're doing, since you're talking about cell segmentation, so the question then becomes, am I just using DAPI or am I going to couple it with cell staining markers? So just to reiterate, if it's DAPI, you have a nuclear prediction model and an expansion model, and there are good algorithms out there. You can use CellPost, you can use Mersmer, you can use Stardist, you can use Astropath, all right? But as uh, you can even fine tune the settings and you can get good results as Ashley has shown. So that exercise was just to give you that sometimes the simplest uh, way of, simplest solution is probably the best, okay? Then you choose your segmentation algorithm and you'll go through this in module four, script one. So you'll plot, all right, the images in the respective channels. And I want you to have a sense of how good these stainings are, all right? And they are not exactly going to be optimal in the tissues that I'm going to show you. Then, of course, you choose your segmentation model. And I just went through this, all right? So in the practical, all right, we won't try any new method, but we will plot the polygons over your image. And then we're going to go through uh, base all. So the standard pipeline is not going to change. This will always be your general flow, all right? So just imagine that you are splitting up now your experimental design into these broad bins, and then you think about how you're going to work on each of these bins and how you're going to connect it to the next step. 